Are, are we good to get started? Yes. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the um, New Jersey Youth Climate Summit. Um, this is the Electric Vehicle Revolution session, and I'll be your moderator today. Uh, I'm Hogan Dwyer. I'm going to share my screen momentarily, and we'll get right into things. All right, like I mentioned, I'm Hogan Dwyer. I'm a research and project specialist at Sustainable Jersey and your moderator today. Um, and this is the EV revolution session of the Climate Summit. Um, a little bit of background on me before we get into things. We have a really exciting presentation today from our electric vehicle expert, Jennifer Grisham. But um, for that, sharing a little bit of background on myself in case you're interested. I have been at Sustainable Jersey for about a year working on the energy team, um, everything from changing light bulbs and buildings to how to buy electric school buses. So obviously very excited to be on this panel. Um, before that, I was actually in college at St. Lawrence University in upstate New York, uh, where I studied and worked on climate change as well. Um, so I've been interested in climate change from a very young age. Really excited to see you all here showing interest as well. And I'd be glad to talk with anyone um, after the presentation about getting involved with climate change action in college and beyond based on my experience. Um, so as I said, I'm the moderator today. So I'll be going over the details of the logistics of interacting with us today. Um, for those of you who might be less familiar with the Zoom webinar format, there's a couple of functions on the bottom of your screen that you can use to interact with us. Um, there's a chat function where you can put in general comments that you have at any point during the presentation. The key there is to make sure that you're set, it's set to all panelists and attendees so that we can all see the wonderful thoughts that you have to share. There's also a raise hand function on the bottom there that you can use to answer questions, to request to answer a question um, by being unmuted and also a, a Q and A box where you can put in questions at any point during this presentation. And I'll be moderating that and making sure that we get to them. Um, so let's give that a little test. We'll start by um, putting in who you are, what your school is and your grade level into the chat. Um, and make sure that, like I said, that you have that set to all panelists and attendees so we can all get a sense of where everyone is coming from. I'll give you a moment to do that. Great, I see some answers coming in. Sixth and seventh graders, great to have you guys here today. Uh, keep those coming. Like I said, make sure you have it set to all panelists and attendees so that we can all see what you're putting in there. Um, another way that we'll have you interact with us today is via the poll system in Zoom. So we'll give that a little test momentarily. Um, the poll should pop up automatically on your screen in just a second. And we'll be asking you to let us know how you are joining us today. So you should see that now on your screen. And we'll give it, give you a couple of seconds to get an answer in. If you haven't answered already, last call for the first poll question. All right, so Hopefully you got in your answer there um, and you should be able to see the results. So I see a bunch of you joining as individual students. Awesome, welcome. Uh, we hope that you'll keep interacting with us with the polls and the questions. Um, this should be a great session, not only presentation, but discussion. So hopefully most of you have been able to join us for earlier sessions in the climate summit 
um, or at least seen some of the recordings. If you have, you might see that, that you might have seen how we're building on some overarching themes, specifically why ch climate change is happening, how climate change will impact us in future generations, and most importantly, what can we all do about it as individuals, as organizations, and as a society? Um, and that sort of gets into the climate challenge that we'll be discussing later. Hopefully you're thinking about what sorts of submissions you might make to that challenge um, to find solutions to this big issue um, on the local level. And so with that, um, I'm happy to now turn it over to our electric vehicle expert, Jennifer Grisham from Atlantic City Electric and Pepco. Um, she'll be sharing a presentation and prepare to learn a lot. Thank you for that introduction, Bogan. And I am really excited to be here today. I hope everyone can see my screen. Can you give me a thumbs up? If you can, not yet. Okay. What's that now? Perfect. Okay. Great, wonderful. And like I said, I'm very excited to be here. Again, my name is Jennifer Grisham, and I am the Principal Program Manager for Electric Vehicles at Pepco Holdings. We operate a number of utilities in the Mid-Atlantic region, including Atlantic City Electric in South Jersey. Um, I actually uh, live and work in Washington, D.C., but I do a lot of work for our ACE uh, utility as well. Um, something interesting about me, uh, I actually started uh, 12 years ago at ACE, or Pepco Holdings in our finance department. I have a business degree. Um, moved around within the company and found myself in electric vehicles. So I've become, over the last couple of years, our electric vehicle expert and um, very interested, not just interested, but really passionate about the topic. It is very fascinating. There's so many different facets to it that we'll discuss today and uh, looking to bring EVs to, to everyone. So. Again, you know, I realize that y'all are in school all day and so happy that you uh, decided to come to this session. We really do want this to be interactive just to make this as interesting as possible for you all. So if you have any thoughts or ideas or, or questions that you want to share during this presentation, please feel free to do so. Don't wait until the, uh, the end of the session. Okay. All right. Oops. You know what, we're going to view this in Okay, so electric vehicles have received a significant amount of attention over the last few years for the role that they're playing um, and will play in both the automobile industry and as a tool to fight climate change. The list that you see on the left just shows a list of topics that people often think about when we talk about electric vehicles. And there are a lot of different perceptions as well as misconceptions about every topic on this list. And then over the next hour, we're gonna learn about the basics of EVs address some of these perceptions, bust some of these uh, misconceptions and myths, and then also brainstorm about how we can help bring EV adoption to New Jersey. Okay. So one of the first misconceptions that we'll start with is the one that just, um, you know, with all the recent popularity of EVs, that they're really just a fad and something that's going to be replaced in the next year or two with um, the newest different uh, technology. In reality, EVs have been around for almost 200 years, as you might be able to tell from uh, the lovely photo here and the styling above. And this is actually one of the first models of EVs and the woman that's plugging in is charging her vehicle. So while the technology has advanced leaps and bounds just over the last decade, the concept isn't exactly new. And uh, now we're just gonna watch a short a three and a half minute video, we might not watch the entire thing, but just gives a brief history about EVs. An electric car actually ends up being getting more range for, for a given amount of, say, coal or oil that's burned than a gasoline car gets. As concern for the environment rises, we are seeing increasing demand for electric vehicles. Though EVs today are presented as new innovations, the fact is that such cars go back around a century. While there's a dispute at what point in history EVs were born. We can take 1828 as our starting point. That's the year in which Anjos Istvan Jedlik made the first electric car. Back then it was in the form of a model. Perhaps that is why many histories skip that contribution. 
Rather, they take 1834 or 1835 as the year in which electric cars were born and give credit to an American, Thomas Davenport. It was then that Davenport built a small locomotive that was powered by two electromagnets and ran on a track. A few other inventors dabbled with electric cars during that decade, and the peak of the electric car is considered to be about 1900. At that time, electric cars made up about a third of all cars manufactured in the United States. However, by the 1920s, electric cars would stop being commercially viable as gas power became a lot more accessible and people wanted vehicles that could go longer distances and had more horsepower. Henry Ford dominated the car industry beginning in 1908 with his mass production of gas-powered cars. For over 60 years, these cars continued to advance. While gas was plentiful and inexpensive, people were content with their internal combustion engines. But by the late 1960s, there was a change. Gas prices started to climb steeply, and there was the beginning of concern over air pollution. Congress introduced the first bills promoting EVs in 1966. Spurred on by the rise of government regulations, American car makers tried to integrate electric power in cars in the form of hybrids. But the real revolution in the field came out of Japan. Toyota introduced the Prius, the first commercially mass-produced and marketed hybrid car. It was a hit from the start, with close to 18,000 units sold the first year. Then other manufacturers entered the arena, most notably Tesla. In 2006, the firm unveiled the Tesla Roadster, while in 2009, GM released the Chevy Volt, which marked a first for plug-in hybrids. The technology used in its battery was developed by the U.S. Department of Energy. More importantly for the electric car market as a whole, the Department of Energy invested in the batteries used for such cars, which reduced the price by half over the earlier part of this decade. By 2014, there were 23 plug-in and 36 hybrid car models on the market. That number has grown with contributions from automakers around the world. Okay, I'm gonna stop, pause the video there. I think we, um gotten some of the really important points. It's a really interesting video that just talked about, you know, it reiterated that EVs really aren't new. You know, um, when I was growing up, it was unheard of, but it turns out our great, great grandparents probably were pretty familiar with them. Okay. So I'll move on to the next slide. Okay. All right. So let's start with the basics of EVs. First question, has anyone here ever ridden or driven an electric vehicle? And I'd love to know what your thoughts were on it. So feel free to use the raise hand function. Um, Hogan, can we start with you? Any? Do you have ever driven in one? I have. Already? I have one of my coworkers at Sustainable Jersey um, has a Nissan Leaf, so I got to ride in that. It was very cool, very quiet, and it was springy, so it seemed like a little bit of fun to drive, even though I was the passenger. Right. Right. I think that was the thing that I first noticed when I first uh, drove one for the first time. You know, you turn it on and you're like, is this car even on? It's so <laughs> quiet. Any of any of our, our student participants ever driven or ridden in, in an EV? Oh, yeah. That's okay. So we'll just get started with um, with some of the basics here. As the name states, electric vehicles are vehicles that are powered by electricity. And because these vehicles use electricity instead of gasoline, they emit less and sometimes zero greenhouse gas emissions into the air that we breathe. Each electric vehicle has uh, unique characteristics determined by the battery, which are referred to as the range. And that's the maximum number of miles that the car can run on electricity. And it's kind of analogous to um, the size of a car's gasoline tank. And there are two different types of electric vehicles. The first being all electric vehicles, sometimes called battery electric vehicles. And these uh, typically, the electric range these days are anywhere from 100 to 200 miles. But some of the newer models are approaching um, 300 and, and coming close to even exceeding them too. Uh, the second type of EVs are uh, plug-in hybrid vehicles. 
these run on electricity for a bit of a shorter range, anywhere from six to 40 miles. Um, they switch to an internal combustion engine using gasoline once the battery is depleted. And EVs vary in cost depending on the model. Um, there can be a huge variety in the cost. The most expensive EV is actually that Tesla Roadster that we saw in the video previously. Anyone have an idea how much that costs right now? You can put it into the chat or, or chime in. Well, it is actually $200,000, which is a lot of money. Um, most high-end EVs are only around $100,000, which is still a lot, but uh, there are over 25 either all electric vehicles or plug-in hybrids that are uh, priced under $35,000, which is the average cost of a car running on gasoline. And that includes the two cars that you see here, the, um, the uh, Bolt as well as the RAV4 Prime, which is the RAV4 Prime being a plug-in hybrid and the Bolt being a fully electric vehicle. And then also, um, if you buy a used EV, that helps bring down the cost naturally and helps make it more affordable for average consumers. So when we think of EVs, we often think of light duty cars, the passenger vehicles such as the sedans and the, e and the uh, SUVs that we saw on the previous slide. But there are actually many different types of vehicle classifications that are moving towards electricity. Uh, we've got medium and heavy duty vehicles, the 18 wheelers, uh, the delivery trucks, transit buses, and even school buses. And electrifying these vehicles is especially important because they operate, they tend to operate in areas that are more urban that tend to be more negatively affected by greenhouse gas emissions. And these areas also uh, tend to have people of lower income and disadvantaged residents. These people often lack access to, to proper health care. They may not even drive a car, so they don't get to reap the benefits of EVs that we talked about um, previously with the cleaner air quality. And this gives them a better chance to participate in the EV revolution. Okay, um, this slide is about EV technology. So uh, similar to gas vehicles, batteries are essential for electric vehicles to run. There are three types of batteries, lithium ion batteries, nickel metal hydride batteries, and then ultra capacitors. The picture that you see here is of a lithium ion battery. Uh, one of the concerns that some people have regarding environmental benefits of EVs is just uh, is the battery itself and specifically what happens when the battery reaches the end of its useful life. And uh, typically that useful life is around 10 years. It could be a little bit longer, it could be a little bit less, but uh, anyone have an idea of what happens when that battery's reached its useful life? I will tell you, you can recycle it. And that is becoming even a bigger market, not a bigger market, but a huge market in just the last few years because of the EV revolution that we're talking about. Um, some of those first you know, popular cars are, are starting to reach that 10 year life. So uh, there are firms out there that just specialize in recycling EV batteries. So it's something that um, you know, was a concern when the technology first started to become more popular and more mainstream, but there are uh, different organizations out there that are addressing it. Okay, so how do we get EV batteries to run? Well, uh, as the slide notes, we charge them. And there are three different types of charging for EVs and they all charge vehicles at different rates and power levels. The first one is a level one. Uh, that's the standard plug that comes with any new EV that you purchase, uh, you plug into a standard outlet. It's the slowest charge available. Um, if your battery were at 0%, uh, it would take about 10 hours to reach nearly full charge. The second charger is level two. Uh, many people use these at their homes to get a faster charge. Um, they can also manage it remotely, manage their charger remotely, which is a good thing. So, um, you know, if you're if you want to come home at, at five o'clock or so, and, but not charge your vehicle until 11, you can program it to do so. That's not something that you can really do with a level one because you just you know plug it in and it just starts charging right away. Um, level twos are also frequently found in the public, usually at retail locations and office buildings, um, places where people are going to spend several hours because this one, uh, level two, takes about half the time to charge a vehicle that a level one would. <clears throat> 
And then the last one are uh, sometimes called level three, but they're DC fast chargers. And these are stations that charge battery uh, very quickly, as the name states. They're usually found near major roads and highways, rest stops, um, places where people only need to spend you know, 10 or 15 minutes to charge their car because that's how, how powered they are. So two factors determine how fast an EV charges. Um, one being the amount of energy the charging station can dispense. Uh, we talked about earlier, but um, I don't say ranking, but one obviously emits power the slowest and three the fastest. And then also it's just the amount of energy that a particular electric vehicle can even accept. We've got some cars out there that can't even <clears throat> that can't even take a DC fast charge, so they're limited to just level ones and level twos. So it really just depends on the vehicle. And the fast chargers, I said they tend to take you know 15 to 20 minutes to charge a car, and the technology is just um, advancing so rapidly. We're coming out with 350 kilowatt hour um, chargers that are able to charge a vehicle in <clears throat> five to 10 minutes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Uh, the purpose is to note that there are different types of plugs depending on your vehicle. Uh, the level, uh, okay. so the level two charger that you see here, this J1772, is just a standard um, level two charge that any vehicle can can accept meaning a, a Tesla or if you've got a Nissan Leaf or a the Toyota Prius Prime that we saw earlier. The next two at the bottom are DC fast charging station uh, plugs. There are two different ones. Uh, the CCS one that uh, tends to be more for BMW, Ford, Jaguar, Honda, Hyundai, and Kia. I think there's also Mazda uses uh, this one, the CCS one. And then there's the Chadmo, which is for uh, Nissan and Mitsubishi. And then last, Tesla. So Tesla has its own proprietary network. I'm not going to bore you too much with that. What it means is that um, only Tesla cars can use the Tesla plug. Okay. You can get an adapter to use any of these plugs. So a Tesla owner can get an adapter and use any of these plugs that they see out in the public. But an automobile that can only take these cannot use a Tesla plug. So I want everyone to just chime in here and think about, you know, what challenges do you think are presented by there being so many different types of plugs out there, keeping in mind that charging stations are also found in the public. So I'll give everyone um, 30 seconds, type into the chat box, raise your hand, let us know. What do you think here? Any while, we're, while we're waiting for that, Jennifer, we do have a, a great question yeah. uh, about who puts in the charging stations? Like, how do they get there in the first place? That is a great question. That's a great question. I didn't want to dive too much into it, but I'm glad someone's interested. So um, usually it's a, a relationship between a, um, a business owner or a government and um, a provider of charging stations. So not to plug us, but uh, not, that's a really bad pun, but to plug us. So utilities often um, install charging stations that are out in the public, okay? But there are also other vendors out there. Tesla has their own network that um, you'll see, I probably see at some of the major um, you know, shopping areas and rest areas that you know, at, at the Tesla company is, has an arrangement with um, say the county or the state and they'll install a number of different charging stations. There's uh, Electrify America, there's EVgo, ChargePoint, a number of different organizations will partner with say, you know, a 7-Eleven and say, hey, would you like a charging station here or a grocery store and um, install a charger. Very cool. And we also have a question about this slide. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that there's adapters. To mm -hmm. Um, so someone's wondering how much those cost um, and, and whether you would get that from like the dealer who sold you the car or where. 
So best to get it from the dealer. It's really not that expensive, maybe $50 or so. You could probably find it on Amazon, but um, I love Amazon, but you know, sometimes there can be challenges with getting things that are legitimate, just like you wouldn't buy you know, a $50 brand new iPhone off of Amazon, you never know what you're going to get. So usually it's best to buy it from the dealer um, that you want to get the adapter from. Okay. So I don't think anyone's answered that question about what challenges multiple plug connectors present, which is okay. Um, we can answer it ourselves. It's, it's kind of an obvious um, answer here. You're kind of limiting the charging opportunities that are out there. Hopefully everyone has seen at least seen one public charging station out in their community, whether it be at a grocery store or a library or someplace. But you know, if I drive a, um, a Nissan Leaf and there's only Tesla banks within you know, 50 miles of my house, I might get stranded. You know, if, if my vehicle's not charged, how am I gonna charge my car if I, if I can't get home and I'm running on low battery, right? So that's just one of the challenges um, that having different types of connectors presents. And uh, the industry is trying to come up with a solution to address that. The primary solution is just bring more charging stations out there, right? So that if, um, if, if you're, you know, driving that Toyota Prius Prime and, well, I guess that runs on gasoline too, it's a bad one. If you're, uh, you know, driving that, that Leaf and there's only a, a Tesla one near you, well, hopefully with the EV revolution that's coming, there might be, um, you know, Chadmo a mile away. And hopefully you're not driving your vehicle on only one mile of battery, because that's not good. <laughs> okay, any other general questions? One more thing um, that I wanted to mention. There is such great technology with charging batteries, but experts often recommend that you not charge your battery up to 100% because it helps, um, not helps, but it causes the battery to run down a little sooner than it needs to. So usually you want to get it to about 90%, 95%. And there are solutions that, um, especially if you've got a, uh, a level two smart charger that tell you um, how, how charged your battery is. Any other general questions about charging. Okay, quick, short quiz that I want everyone to participate in. It's really not hard, but based on what you've learned so far. Um, poll. Can the poll be answered with just a question or does it have to be A, B, C, D? Do you know, Hogan? Uh, this That's this okay. one, yeah, this one, I don't think we have a poll for this one. Okay, well, let's look so uh, in the chime question. in or, yeah. or just or just type into the, the box. Which charger would you be least likely to find at home between level one, level two, and level three? Has yeah, it looks like three is the winner on that. Three one. is the winner. That is perfect. Yes, uh, there's you. If you're charging at home, which is where people do the majority of their charging, uh, about eighty percent of their charging, there's no need for you to have to charge in fifteen minutes, right? Unless you're constantly coming and going and driving three hundred miles and coming back home, and and who does that, right? So, and also uh, not just that, but a level three takes so much um, energy usage, you couldn't even really install it in your home. So usually people stick with the level one and the level two at home. Which charger would you be most likely to find in a movie theater? And I'll, I'll answer some of these myself, but unless someone else has a movie theater, think about a movie theater, what happens? Especially if you're watching an epic movie theater with lots of previews, you're spending three or four hours there. We've got lots of votes for level two. Level two, perfect. And then the last one, which charger would you be least likely find at a convenience store? <laughs> 
probably got the most votes yet for level one. For so level one, it. exactly. Because who could spend 10 hours at a convenience store, right? That's a lot of um, chips and soda to get, right? <laughs> yeah. So a level one is least likely to be found at a convenience store. Thanks, everyone. Jennifer, we have a yes. couple of questions in the Q&A box. So yes. there's, there's one from uh, Mrs. Mead that asks, can we get a charging station at home connected to solar panels? Yes, some people are doing that. Yes, um, we always recommend because the utility can't do home installations that you just find a, a licensed electrician to do that for you. And then the other question is, is which is better, electric or hybrid car? Uh, it really depends on your needs and uh, there are lots of different quizzes out there. Um, maybe I should have said this in the, about me, but I live in a, I live in the city in Washington, DC and I live in a row home. So uh, we don't have our own like garage or driveway. So it could be challenging for my family to have a fully electric vehicle, especially since I'm not going to work, you can't ch charge my, my car. So um, the hybrid might work best for me. But if you, um, you know, like I said, a lot of it's lifestyle and preference. Thank you. Okay. Okay. And uh, that first myth that we talked about, electric vehicles have really soared in popularity over the last 10 years. Back in 2010, when uh, many of you are probably very, maybe babies were very small, there were only 30 EVs sold in the entire state of New Jersey. Okay, what, that's one in every 20,000 cars. And then just last year, it is 14,000 sold in New Jersey. So one in every 35 cars sold in New Jersey was either plug-in hybrid or all battery electric. What is the most popular EV model in New Jersey? Uh, I don't want to run too short on time, so I'll tell you all the answer. And that is the Tesla Model 3. Although there are a number of different um, brands that are popular, Tesla Model 3 is right now is the top. Okay, quick question. Um, based on what you learned so far, why do you think electric utilities encourage EV drivers to charge their vehicles overnight? And hopefully this picture here that I put in kind of gives you a good indication. I'll give a short period to, to think about this. So a great analogy to think of is if you plug too many cords into the same socket at your home, you know, what will happen? At best, you might get a shock. Uh, a little worse, you might blow a fuse and have to restart the power at your house. Uh, worst case scenario, you could even start a fire. And that is kind of similar to our concerns about our electric grid, okay? Um, with all the power and electricity being used every single day, adding EV charging on it without proper planning could potentially be a strain on our grid. So that leads to uh, complete power outages and, and such if we're not properly anticipating this. And there's a number of different solutions to help address this. One, getting people to charge their vehicle overnight. So if you've got that level two charging station at home where you can um, just plug it in as soon as you get home from school or from work and tell it charge at uh, 1 a.m., that's perfect because there's not many people out and about using their power at 1 a.m. And then we can also help incorporate uh, more renewable energy into our grid to help protect the power system in general. So any questions about this? This is something that's concerning to me as someone that works for utility and I know a lot of other uh, energy professionals, but was that a good analogy? I think hopefully why we don't want everyone charging their vehicle at uh, you know six o'clock as soon as they get home or, or five o'clock and some people are still at work and everyone's out and about. Uh, we okay. have another question, Jennifer, for you. Yes. Um, yes. Does the federal government have any incentives plan for giving charging capabilities to apartment complexes? Yes. Okay, so these are questions I didn't think would have been of interest, but I'm so glad to hear them. Uh, New Jersey DEP, well, the federal government has incentives too, but uh, New Jersey's Department of Energy, and I think protection it's called. Environmental protection. Environmental protection has got a significant grant funding right now for EV charging in um, multifamily buildings uh, for fleet and for workplace. So fleet meaning your schools, workplace also meaning schools. So if you install an EV charger, they are, well, you shouldn't install first, you should apply first and then get grant funding. 
And there's also a utility programs that are becoming that will be coming later this year. Uh, ACE will have one that gives I think about ten thousand dollars for the installation of a charging station. Uh, also, New Jersey, um, I think they're called Public Service Electric and Gas (PSEG). Mm -hmm. Then I know the other utilities in New Jersey too are also planning for um, programs as well. So yes, the answer is yes. That sounds like a great project idea mm -hmm. for high school or middle school students to kind of spearhead the installation of a EV charging station at their school. Yes, absolutely. I think we'll be talking about that later too. So great idea. Okay, and you know what? Um, before we get too far into it, um, that was actually a fantastic question because multifamily buildings, apartments and condos are often uh, some of the last ones for people to be able to um, adopt or to purchase a DV because it's the question of where will I charge it? So it's a market that is really important to help provide charging uh, solutions to, especially because those buildings tend to be in more urban areas that, as we talked about before, are more affected by um, carbon emissions. Okay. All right, so quick knowledge check. I think these are some, hopefully some of them will be pretty easy, but um, these are poll questions that we'll have. I think I've got about four of them. So see what you've learned so far. I, some of them I have not given the answer to, but just based on what you've learned, let's see um, what our best uh, guesses are. All right. The first one, what year was the first car powered by an electric battery? Okay. I know the year one year's off, but it's there's okay. All right. So the answer is actually the 1827, 1828, and that was the model car. So again, this technology has been around for a, a couple of hundred years almost at this point. But next question. According to the US Department of Energy, what percentage of EV charging occurs at home? This is an interesting question, Jen, given that we're all spending a lot of time at home now. That is true. This that question, is the true. answer to this may have, may be different in 2020 and 2021, but <laughs> so I'll accept two answers. So yeah, okay, so the answer is actually 80. I think it, I didn't write it down anywhere, but I did mention that. But um, as Hogan mentioned right now, it probably is upwards of 90 at this point. Next question, what is an EV's range referring to? Not to be confused with the range and the cost. And the answer is the number of miles run on battery. Glad to see so many of you um, got that one right. Good job. I think, oh, okay, true, false. Experts recommend charging an EV's battery to 100% for optimal performance.
And the answer is, oh, it's actually false. Um, experts recommend not charging to 100% because that helps to run down the battery. You should really charge to about uh, somewhere around 90%. About half and half there. And the last question for our Marvel fans out there. Which EV was featured in the movie Avengers Endgame? Kia Soul, Tesla Model X, Toyota Prius Prime, or the Audi e-tron? <laughs> and this one I did not mention. <laughs> If I remember correctly, I think Iron Man was was driving this. He was. He did drive it, and it was the Audi e-tron. Very impressive. I had to look that up myself. I'm sure my kids would have known that. <laughs> but good job, everyone, and good guesses. Great. Awesome. So for the next uh, 19 minutes, we're going to do uh, some brainstorming here. Uh, I think it, Nancy and Renee mentioned it and the uh, earlier in the call, but we want to talk about what we can do to help uh, bring EVs to the broader community. So first, think about some things that I talked about and some things that you may already know about EVs or some things that maybe you can just infer from the conversation. But let's talk about what type of benefits EVs bring to us. And I'm going to go into a shorter, a smaller mode so that I can write. But I want everyone to take a few minutes um, to think about both benefits and barriers. Barriers meaning what makes it hard for someone to drive an EV. And some of them I already talked about, but you can raise your hand and um, I think we can call on people. Or you can type into the chat. So take a couple of minutes and type benefits, this, 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 barriers, this, this, this. And we'll compile all of our answers. Don't be shy. We'd love to hear some of the students uh, talk. Um, so if you're interested in responding to Jennifer's question, just raise your hand and we can unmute you. Yes, absolutely. We do have one idea so far from right a benefit is that it helps the environment, which is a great reason. So keep those ideas coming. You can put them in the chat, or like we said, raise your hand so we can know to call on you. Kelly Chen has another good idea because we're reducing fossil fuel use. So that's good because we don't have to burn it and pollute, but also we don't have to go find the fossil fuels, which takes a lot. Wow, Cody Sullivan has a bunch of ideas. He agrees better for the environment. They're quieter. I like that idea. More efficient. Yeah, and then for challenges, it's harder because there's not many charging ports, which is true, something that we're working on and maybe something that you guys can be thinking about in terms of a, a project. How do we get people to put more charging ports out there? And also a barrier that it doesn't charge quickly which we, we talked about. That's another technology that we're working on fixing. You were right, as far as it's come, it's still, and I'm a big EV proponent, as far as we've come, it's still not, you know, 30 seconds at the gas pump. Right. And another idea there is the range, getting worried that you can't go yes. very far. That is actually called range anxiety. 
And I do know uh, this was this was probably six or seven years ago before there were uh, many public chargers. A colleague that did um, bat his battery ran out and had to get a tow. So oh, no. it, it can and does happen if you don't prepare yourself. Yeah. But regular cars have to get towed too sometimes. That's true. That's true. Yeah. And um, if I can write one in here, something that people don't think about. People often think EVs are really expensive. And right now, um, a comparable model of an internal combustion engine and an EV, the EV will be a little bit more expensive. But think about the maintenance, right? You're not having to go to the gas pump all the time. You're not having to check. Um, I think I read somewhere the only maintenance thing that EVs really have to do are brake pads. That's like the, the major thing not major specific to EVs, but um, there's just a lot less, you know, you know, oil changes going to the shop for all that. So that's over the lifetime of the vehicle, the cost does not have to be as much. I'll put less needs. Yeah, and we had a couple chats about um, costs. It's benefit of tax incentives, but still the barrier of that it costs sometimes more upfront. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I will say that that is a reason why, unfortunately, we don't see a ton of um, electric school buses yet. And I know that um, you know school districts across the country are very interested, but a um, electric school bus probably costs about $200,000 more than a traditional um, bus that runs on gasoline. What about what I mentioned about where someone lives? If you live in a townhouse or an apartment, maybe you're less likely to, um, to get an EV because you don't have your own dedicated charging. I think that goes to lack of charging points, but, um, you know, lifestyle. Any other um, ones that we've missed? Yep. Jacob had the idea of um, saving money on gasoline. Yes, less maintenance. Great one. So let's see, here we've got here, lack of, okay, let's go through all of these and make sure we, there's nothing that we think we've missed. But the benefits, obviously the big one being the environmental benefits and reducing fossil fuel. Uh, the environment, they're quieter. The efficiency, and I'm glad, I think it was Cody that said efficiency. Thank you, Cody. One of the misconceptions about uh, EVs is that they're they're not very fast, so you can't, um, if you want a big muscle car, it's not going to be the same. Yes, you're not going to hear that, you know, boom, 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 boom. But the cars that are coming out uh, now are just as fast. That Porsche 911 has got, it's either hybrid or EV. Uh, these are very, like, fast uh, powered cars. So that misconception is absolutely busted. Uh, less maintenance. The lifetime cost savings, especially... Well, I remember when gas was 99 cents when I was um, first learning how to drive. But you know, if gas gets back up to five, six dollars a gallon. I mean, that's a lot of money that you're spending every week to, to, to fill your tank. So there's that. Uh, also, tax incentives, and I will say tax incentives, grants, and other programs, including the utility, just to plug. <laughs> uh, so any other benefits that we think we're missing? I think these are all fantastic that you've thought of. Okay, some of the barriers to adoption, the lack of charging ports, that's still a fantastic one. Unfortunately, in our uh, New Jersey Service Territory in ACE, I think there's only like two fast chargers in the entire area, which is not enough. Um, you know, um, research has said that we need at least 200, which ACE is working to help bring as well as the state. Just the initial cost is more uh, the time to charge. That can be a, um, 
a barrier for, for some people who aren't maybe as used to EVs. Uh, again, that lifestyle and, and dwelling. Range anxiety is a huge one. I think at one point, this was the number one reason why people said at least 10 years ago, um, they would or were apprehensive about purchasing an EV. Um, any other barriers? I think, I think we got some good ones. Yeah, we, we just had one comment about the health. Someone was concerned that electric vehicles might not be good for your health. Okay, um, let's hear, does that person care to, to say what they've heard or what their concern is? Okay, we'll still put that as a barrier to adoption. Oh, because even if, um, I haven't read too many studies that EVs are harmful to your health, but if there's even that perception that people have, then that is absolutely a barrier to adoption. Okay. So I think we have a good list here. All right, now, we're going to do one more list and think about, you know, we've heard over the last hour how awesome EVs are, how fantastic they are, the benefits that they provide. So we talked earlier in the, um, the hour about equitable access to EVs and how that's a challenge and how, you know, some of these barriers are causing um, EVs not to be adopted in, in certain areas, especially those that are more affected by the greenhouse gas emission and smog and such. So what can we, let's think about over the next few minutes, what we can do, what our leaders can do, and just what you as a student can do to help promote EVs in New Jersey. So take a couple of minutes and chime in or write into the chat and let's discuss. Jennifer, um, Ray typed into the chat to follow up on the health question about he had heard that they might admit uh, things that cause a, a cancer risk. I, okay, thank you. Thank you for following up on that. Um, I'm going to admit that they're called zero emission vehicles, but there, there are some you know environmental factors just with the manufacture of EVs similar to any other uh, vehicle. I had never heard about um, you know EVs causing cancer. So if there's an informal study out there that proves that, like I said, I haven't read that or heard that. But if that conception is or misconception is out there, then that's absolutely a barrier for some folks. So thank you for bringing it up. But back to this one, think about what we can do, what our leaders can do, what our elected officials can do, and what we can do, what I say we, what students can do. How can you advocate to help make sure that everyone has got access to either an EV or EVs in their neighborhoods? So meaning those transit buses, school buses, um, even electric scooters possibly, think about, ride share that's popular where you live, car sharing that's more in urban areas. Maybe I'm answering this myself, but think about that. Rai has a great idea of creating a program for, for low income people to get electric yes. vehicles. Yes. I think that's for, for leaders, but maybe students could be involved too. What could students do maybe to encourage their leaders to come up with that program? Kelly says, help fundraise for neighborhoods. That is fantastic. I 
forgot how much fundraising we do in school. The I guess we don't do lemonade stands anymore, but the bake sales and the car washes. That's a great idea. Car wash for EVs. And Jacob says that students can make petitions, which is another cool idea. That is a great idea. Thank you, Jacob. I, yeah, I just cannot tell you how important um, the youth voices are to making any kind of, for any kind of advocacy and bringing along change. We're starting to uh, come up on two o'clock, so we'll do a last call for ideas here. I was thinking maybe if our leaders drive electric vehicles and we see them driving them, then that helps. Yes. I will say driving an EV is the best form of promotion out there. Seeing your neighbor drive one. Yeah, and I know students can't necessarily drive them, but maybe just telling people mm -hmm. about them. Yep. Yes, this is fantastic, everyone. Um, really appreciate all this feedback that you've given. Hogan, I, yeah, I know you said it's coming answers. up on two. Yeah. Um, so I think we'll we'll start to wrap up here. Do you have any last I thoughts? Think so. Just thank you. <laughs> we can stay here. Would you like to wrap it up, Hogan? Yeah, I'll um, take back the screen if you don't yeah. mind, just yep. for the last bit. But that was that was really great, and I loved all the different ideas. I hope you, everyone had had some more ideas um, rolling around. So think about that in terms of the the challenge that's coming up. The, so um, I'll mention some details on that in a moment. But first, just want to thank. Sorry, Jennifer. Uh, no, I just saw some great suggestions in the chat box now that I can see, but um, organizing some test drives of EVs at school, that is a great yeah. one, yeah. Yeah, that's really big, great ideas. Um, so I just have to wrap up with um, a thank you from our partners, Drone Thwacket Foundation, Atlantic City Electric and Exelon Foundation. Um, they were the ones that helped make it possible. We're glad to have you all here for the electric vehicle session. As a reminder, um, the Climate Summit registration is remains open, so invite your friends to come join us for some of the upcoming sessions. Next week on Tuesday, we have the Renewable Energy Options session. That's the next one. And you can find recordings of the sessions that have already happened, including this one on the Sustainable Jersey for Schools website. Um, a little bit after they happen. We also have some professional development opportunities for teachers. The next one is on Monday, the new exploring the new New Jersey um, student learning um, standards, sorry, for climate change in high school. And finally, like I mentioned, there's the climate contest that you pro hopefully have all heard about already. Um, the registration opens for that pretty soon and we'll be taking submissions through June 11th. So that kind of gives you a few months to be thinking about how you might want to promote electric vehicles or work on other sustainability issues uh, around climate change and then get your submissions in. So thanks again to everyone for being here. Thank you, Jen, for the really informative presentation. And um, with that, I'll wrap it up. Everyone ha hope everyone has a wonderful weekend. Just a quick reminder that a survey will pop up when you uh, go out of the webinar. Please fill that out so we have your feedback for, for reference in future planning. Right. Thank you, Renee, for mentioning that. We're, we're hoping to do bigger and better events as we go, as we um, have more of these 
youth climate summits. So please, any feedback that you can give us, just take a couple minutes right after you exit. <laughs> 